your feet wherever you are. Let's worship Jesus tonight. Let's worship Jesus tonight. Come out.
three. And I'm believing that it's going to be yours because this is your season. I feel with every fiber of my being that God is going to give you a 365, a year in a day. That's where it is that we are, uh, that uh, we are expecting that God can tilt the entire year by a demonstration of just one day. Those of you who have a like-minded faith, I want you to just put 365 on the screen. We're hedging our faith towards the last Sunday in October uh, where we're going to put a mandate on heaven. Uh, that on that last Sunday in October, all of us are going to uh, bring a sacrificial seed that will uh, pull on uh, the hem of his garment. Say, God, you've seen what kind of year this has been. We need a dramatic, revolutionary, radical turnaround to take place and to happen. I, I've got uh, something uh, really uh, gnawing at my spirit uh, that I've got to download to you on tonight. I want you to do me a favor. Would you share this with somebody? Would you text somebody? Would you tell somebody? Would you tag somebody that this word I'm telling you uh, is going to illuminate your understanding and revolutionize your conscience? Uh, it is uh, part one of a two-part segment uh, that God has given me. I'm going to start it tonight. There's no way. I'm going to be able to finish it on this night. And so you're going to have to uh, jump back and get me on uh, next Tuesday for the conclusion of the matter. Uh, but if you would, would you uh, secure your Bibles and meet me in John's Gospel, chapter 6. John's Gospel, chapter 6. And I'm going to look at verses 5 through 7. John's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 5 through 7. I'm most appreciative for our music ministry, even on a Tuesday, uh, getting us in the throne room of God uh, to be able to worship him. God is good all the time, not just on Sunday, uh, but even on a Tuesday night. John chapter 6, verses 5 and through 7, uh, here's what the word of God says according to the New International Version. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked him this only as a test, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than six months wages to buy enough food for each one of them just to have a bite, not even a full meal. Just to have a bite, it will cost us six months wages. I want to uh, ask that you would uh, arm yourself with a writing instrument. Go to the note-taking section uh, in your device, your tablet, your smartphone. Grab a pen if that's the only thing available to you. I want to teach uh, tonight using as a subject, I'm trying to get saved. I'm trying to get saved. Yesterday morning, I rolled out of the bed to head to the gym to go work out. And with sleep in my eyes, I grabbed a bottle of water, mask, and keys, fumbled my way into the garage to get in my car. The radio came on, but the ignition failed to turn over. Every light came flashing on, but the engine stayed off. I enlisted assistance from my armor bearer who resigned uh, that I had to, in fact, deal with what I was in denial of. And that was that the car needed to be towed. I was rewarded with a bill for $125. And then once assessed, the work that needed to be done was going to take me a full total of $625. I reached for my debit card, and while I was mid-stride, I realized that this one transaction of what it is that I was going to spend for something I had not prepared, something I had not planned on, what I was going to have to spend in just one moment, one instance, was half of what black America has in savings. 
It's going to cost me $645. And the average black family that is watching me tonight doesn't even have $1,000 in savings. According to the CNBC, 66 million Americans have no emergency savings. 66 million Americans have no emergency savings. COVID-19 has become the Buick that has blindsided the budget of over 11 million who were terminated as allegedly not being non-essential workers. According to the website GoBankingRates.com, I want to offer it to you, GoBankingRates.com, more women are in a financial bind than men. Can you believe that? More women are in a financial bind than men. In fact, 62% of women compared to 53% of men are in a financial entanglement. This doesn't factor that women are getting paid less in our community and as a consequence have more responsibility and are having to shelve out more. 13% of men have do, only 13% of men in the country, barring all ethnicities, only 13% of men have more than 50,000 in savings. It is only 6% of women that have that amount. I want you to write that down because it's going to make sense to you not uh, too many moments from here. Only 13% of men, black, white, Latino, Asian, have $50,000 in savings, and only 6% of women have $50,000 in savings. Gen Xers, Gen Xers between uh, 35 and 44, are the hardest, here it is, are the hardest headed at saving money. Those between the ages of 35 and 44. Gen Xers, 37% of them, 37% of all Gen Xers, you're not going to believe it, don't even have a savings account. 37% of all Gen Xers do not have a savings account. Older Gen Xers, older Gen Xers are between 45 and 54 percent Eight, between 45 and 54 have the highest amount of any demographic with no savings for those who are under 62. Different than previous generations, this generation, the one in which I occupy and am a citizen of, this generation is saddled, I want you to write this down, by lifestyle debt. By lifestyle debt. It is not uh, student loans. It's not home mortgages. It's credit cards for accessories and for things that are not essential to their existence. Part and parcel as a subculture of what has been influenced because of social media and doing it for the gram. 53%. 53% of Gen Xers still live with their parents. The highest number in American history obstructing what should be the natural evolution of God's design of every generation doing better than the previous generation. This is the first generation poised and positioned to fail worse than their parents. They're getting married later, not buying any homes, not in fact finding their own niche, but are still finding themselves as legal squatters in the place in which they've been raised. 
Part of uh, the reason why it is that we find ourselves in this inglorious lot that has to be examined on this night can be pinpointed back to low salaries. Can be pinpointed back to low salaries. 31% of those who were polled, and there were 5,000 in all, 31% of those that were polled said that they can't save when they are not earning a livable wage. Wow. They cannot save when they are not earning a livable wage. And yet tonight, while it is that I stand, Two people are on a stage in Cleveland, Ohio, and neither of them are going to broker what is the strategy, the roadmap, or the blueprint to lift up the bottom tide of those who are at the lowest economic stratum. All that they're going to discuss one hour from now will be about preserving the middle class, maintaining the wealthy, but nothing about equipping the poor. Part of our responsibility as the body of Christ called church is Jesus asked of us, have you considered the poor? The poor even in the budget. What is it that we're going to have to do? Just uh, a week ago, we received an uh, email from our partners at World Vision. For the last 24 weeks, we have been uh, feeding upwards from five to 8,000 families every week. And we received a letter from World Vision saying that we only have two weeks left because the program is being cut from our church. Being cut from our church, not because they have run out of funding, but as a directive from President Trump and the White House administration, do not give the food, hear this, in counties that don't support the president. Wow. And so they are shifting it over to Republican wow. territories and says not only do we want to shift it, but we want you to put in all of those boxes that the food is courtesy of President Donald Trump. Wow. I serve a God who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the throne of grace. Can you imagine what would be our responsibility if Saturday as pastor, I've got to go outside and flag down all of those cars and say, because the president said you don't vote for him. You are not deservant of sustaining your family. What is the responsibility of the church if, in fact, uh, we are not mindful of the widows, of the orphans, and of the poor? We've got to ask resoundingly, as the lawyer asked of the master, who is my neighbor? 31% said that they can't even afford to have savings when they're not making a living. You would uh, know and not be surprised at how many people in crisis immediately as a knee-jerk reaction have made GoFundMe their savings account. How many of us, we only get phone calls from certain people when they are in a fiscal calamity and never hear from them afterwards. I want you to write this down. It's going to be very important for where I'm taking you over the next two weeks. And here it is. Saving takes intention. Saving takes intention. You've got to be intentional about saving. Nobody saves by accident. You've got to be purposeful about it. Got to make up in my mind how it is that I am going to move and galvanize forward. The number one reason why it is that people save is for retirement. And a whole lot of our parents are still working. Hear this, because they can't afford to retire. Do you know how many pastors are still pastoring? Because they cannot afford to sit down 
So they have to be propped up every Sunday. Do you know how many teachers are really burnt out and have already spent their best years, but they have to do it just to keep food on the table? You know how many seniors who should be, in fact, are resting and reclining in the winter of their life, but now have to serve as greeters at Walmart? Because they have no sustainability. Do you know how many have to choose, here it is, between food and prescriptions? Because they had no savings. The fastest growing demographic in the history of the world is in this hour. Do you not know for the first time in the history of this nation, there are more seniors than teenagers? You just missed what I just said. For the very first time in the history of this nation, might I say in the history of humanity, there are more seniors than teenagers. Every day, 100,000 people turn 65. Every day, 100,000 people turn 65, and yet across the length and breadth of the nation, we always have a youth pastor but don't have a seniors pastor. How do we minister to those who are still nimble of mind and have agility of body and yet we don't know how to serve and to minister them? I can't help but to think out loud. I have to wonder while it is that you lean in because I've never considered it until this moment. But um, I want you to uh, explore this thought with me. What do you think was the economy of the crowd that came to hear Jesus in John 6? It's roughly, watch this, 5,000 of them, and I ain't even counting women and children. And here's what you have to know as critical thinkers of new birth. Here it is. It's 5,000 of them, not including women and children. Um, and stick a pin in this. It's not the Sabbath. So nobody in all the time that you've been in church, all the time that you've deliberated around this text, nobody ever considered that the 5,000 were unemployed. Nobody ever thought about that those 5,000 had been considered non-essential workers. Nobody ever thought about that those 5,000, hear this, had been laid off because of COVID-019. Nobody ever thought that these 5,000 were possibly and potentially waiting on a stimulus check. The Bible says that they were drawn to Jesus not just because of his teaching, but that day he's healing. Why are 5,000 sitting in the unrelenting sun waiting, hear this, on a doctor who is not board certified? Have you considered that the 5,000 uh, have no insurance? That the 5,000 have access to no universal health care? Or that the 5,000 potentially have pre-existing conditions? Maybe, just maybe, these 5,000 are headed over to Jerusalem because it's time for the Passover with no job. With health challenges, with fiscal insecurity. And while these 5,000 are listening to Jesus, here's what I needed you to know none of them asked Jesus for food. None of them said, Would you feed us? I love the sensitivity of the discernment of God that He begins working on what I don't have words for. You need to write that down. He's working on what I don't have words for. He then shifts and pivots on his heels, Jesus does, and he asks Philip a critical question. Where can I buy bread for 5,000 people? I got to take a leap right here. I got to take a quantum leap, if you would. Uh, because there is something that is not abstracted, extracted from the text uh, that I think somebody who's listening on this Tuesday night needs to hear. 
Jesus asked to Philip, where is there a bakery close by? Here it is that I can buy 5,000 loaves of bread. And he doesn't have an RSVP. Hadn't made reservation. And what is not written in the text, but I, I want uh, your mind to stretch just to ingest it. Can you imagine how happy that minority business owner would have been to receive an order for 5,000 in one day in the middle of a pandemic? Do you know what would have been the implication if 83% of black businesses are getting ready to close because they got no PPE existence, how it would shift them if in one day they got 5,000 orders? I don't know where you are, but I'm speaking to business owners. I'm speaking to business leaders. I'm speaking to entrepreneurs. I'm talking to innovators and creators. God put in my spirit, get ready. He's got 5,000 contracts that are getting ready to be unleashed into your life. Y'all don't have that kind of faith. I'm talking to somebody who's got enough bandwidth to believe that God can send 5,000 people who need what it is that I offer with no warning. Do you know that there's somebody who's hungry for your gift? Hungry for your potential, hungry for your idea, hungry for your capital, hungry for what it is that you offer. They just need to be directed to you. I don't know how it is you ain't jumping out of your own skin, but God is getting ready to direct 5,000 receipts, 5,000 purchase orders. I'm telling you, look, look in your back room. Something is getting ready to happen on your computer. Out of nowhere, folk are getting ready to find your website. You're getting ready to be referred, here it is, anonymously. That overnight God can up in your business and put you in a whole nother place. He asked Philip, where can I buy 5,000? Loaves of bread. God, I wish I had a music ministry. Amazing thing would happen here is that after it is that he asked the question, he wasn't even waiting on the answer because he already had in mind what he was going to do. Somebody needs to know this tonight. That whenever it is that God places a financial dilemma in front of you, he already knows what he's going to do. Y'all just missed that. Whenever it is, there's a bill that you can't pay. God already has the plan of what he's going to do. He already knows how he's going to strategize it. He already knows that all things are going to work together for your good. Could it be that your financial problem is just a test? Maybe that unpaid bill is God standing back waiting to hear what are you going to say in response how are you going to trust him how are you going to believe when you got to pay for something you don't have money for it is not a trial it's a test I better say it again for three people in the back. When God presents something in front of you, you don't have the money for. It is a test. Will you trust him? He asked Philip. Why does he ask Philip? He don't really even talk to Philip in the gospels. But he asked Philip, how are we going to do this? And the reason why he asked Philip that you're not going to believe it, is because Philip is the only one of the disciples who was raised around there. He says, I'm getting ready to bless you in the area you were raised in. I'm getting ready to do something for you. Here it is. That is familiar to your upbringing. I'm getting ready to show you a mystery of something that nobody in your family could ever fathom, conjure, figure out or negotiate I'm not putting you in a test that is alien to your knowledge or skill set I'm testing you in something you should already know and Philip says something 
that I needed to get to you tonight. And I'm sorry it took me a slow drag just to get to this point. Uh, Philip says um, he never answers Jesus' question on where to buy it. That was his moment to recommend the business and he didn't do it. Too many of you are closed-lipped about your friend's business. You don't promote anybody who's trying to do something. And yet you'll always celebrate strangers. You don't know Rihanna. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. Everything you put on got the label of somebody you never met before. But your friend is trying to sell t-shirts. You won't even tag them. You just trying to look for a discount. Here was Philip's opportunity to promote somebody from home. And he failed the test. And he immediately goes into budget. He says, at one glance, for this to get done will take six months of my wages. I think I've gone too fast. I think I've gone too far. Amazingly, it's 5,000 people there, not including women and children. And Philip says, with the money I'm earning, I could feed all of them in six months. Y'all just missed it. Maybe Tiffany is just me and you in here. He's in full-time ministry. But he makes enough money to feed 5,000. God, y'all missed it. That's, uh, Elder Stokes uh, said, Pastor, if we lose this funding, uh, for us to be able uh, to keep King's Table going, it's going to cost us 20,000 a week. And that's for uh, 8,000. God help me. I'm, I've got to ask you. I've got to ask you a critical question. I've got to ask you a critical question. Because it's, it's hard enough for you to feed your family on the wage you currently make. How much more money, not for five more, but for 5,000, how much will it cost you? And do you have it in your savings? Then something happens, Kyle Lace, that messes me up, is that uh, you got to go back to the earlier portion of the lecture. And the earlier portion of the lecture uh, shares with you, here it is, that the, that the uh, generation that saves the least is millennials. That's the generation that saves the least is millennials. But this is what I love, is that uh, there are 5,000. I got baby boomers there. I got Gen Xers there. I got uh, millennials there. And then they find somebody from Gen Z. A little boy with two fish. Five loaves of bread. He is the only one of the generations that has savings. Preach, Jamal. I'm trying to do the best I can. Uh, nobody else in the whole church has saved anything. But a Gen Z comes up with two fish and five loaves of bread and he saves the generations. God help me. God is getting ready to use a whole nother generation to shift the body of Christ because we have not learned how to save. I'm telling you, a third of churches are going to close before Easter. Because the average church, I shudder to think, don't even have savings account. Many of the congregations are cursed. Hallelujah. Because the chapel is cursed. If the oil flows from the head and goes down to the skirts of the robe, how do you expect the people to be blessed when the pastor don't know how to save? God help me. He, he's getting ready to do something. God gave me an unusual assignment on tonight. An unusual assignment. This is just our introductory class. I'm really going to uh, excavate this on next week. Uh, but here's what God gave me. And I'm telling you, in my entire blessed life in church, I've never heard it. But when God gave it to me, I, I jumped out of my own skin. Would you lift up that hand? I want to speak just one blessing over your life. Just one. 
and I, I, I want to be true to what it is that God has given me. I, I need you to lift your hand, please. I, I've got to give this to you. I'm tell, I will not be able to sleep if I don't get it off me and get it on to you. Here's what God told me to tell the children of God who were locked in on tonight. Here's what God told me to tell you. Please don't put that hand down till I tell you. I want you to receive every morsel of this word that's coming fresh out of the oven of manna. God said in 2021, I'm telling you, there ought to be a rushing mighty wind of expectation, enthusiasm, and worship. God said in 2021, I am going to make sure in your account is six months worth of savings. And I, I, I know y'all don't have that kind of faith. Uh, it's just for a small group of you. Can I give it to you again? I said in 2021, God is going to shift some things in your economy. Not in your checking account, not in your shoe closet, but in your savings and in your retirement will be six months worth of your salary that you won't even have to touch. And I need those of y'all that need God to give supernatural increase to the intentionality of your savings. Would you give God glory and worship for it right now? He said, it's going to take me six months to pay for this. And you already know by now that Jesus takes the bread. He lifts it up. He breaks it. And then he gives it out. And most times, um, most times, Dev, this is where most people in church shout is that uh, he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it out. And, and we thank God for that. But I want to tell you what you've been missing all of these years. What you've been missing is that Jesus did this miracle. Watch this. He provided food for 5,000. Here's the catch that they never asked for. He did this, hear this, not using a bakery that was right in the community. And all this time, you missed the greatest miracle of John chapter 6. The greatest miracle because God already had in mind what he was going to do. He was showing Philip, I'm going to save you the money you should have used out of your savings. The stuff you thought you were going to have to write checks for, I now will provide. The thing you thought you were going to have to get a secondary loan in, I am now going to make a way. The thing, I hope I ain't the only one that will shout about it, you thought you were going to have to save up to get. I'm now going to make it happen in one day when it should have taken you six months to get to this point. I am rejoicing and bursting at the seams because some of you could not conceptualize 365 of God doing one thing that will turn around a whole day. So for those of you with mustard seed faith, if you can't trust him to shift a year in a day, will you believe him for six months? That for six months, God will do for you which you couldn't even save on your own. I don't want to just be hearers of the word. I want to be doers also. I'm going to challenge those of you who are saying, Pastor, you don't even know how you came down my street, kicked in my door, how it is that you rang my bell. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to have the faith of somebody from Gen Z. I want you to offer unto God today a sacrifice of two fish and five loaves of bread. I want every person to align with me in faith that next year God is going to do something for my savings. For some of you who have been wrestling up against COVID-19, God is going to have to restore your savings. He's going to have to replenish your savings. Two fish, five loaves of bread. That little boy gave that offering and it fed 5,000. I want to challenge you on tonight. If you'll meet me with a seed of $25 on this evening. Every single one of you, I want you to do it. I want you to do it. I want you to do it. The little boy did it. I want to know why you can't do it. 
I don't know what your circumstance, I don't know what your condition, I don't know what lot you are in in life. But I want to do this. Here it is because I want to see somebody else get fed. I want to see somebody's business have explosive growth. I want to see somebody have an economic turnaround. Next week, I'm going to be uh, talking to you about how the greatest season to invest in stock. The greatest season to invest in stock, hear this, is November 1st. November 1st, and then uh, you are to sell your stock on May 1st. Greatest season to invest in stock is, Feb is November 1st, then you sell your stock. May 1st. It is called for those who are in the business community the best six months. I'm telling you, that's what you're getting ready to walk into. The best six months. Can you imagine you being compliant to the will of God and seeing a return in it before May 1st? That's what your pastor's praying for you. That's what I am believing God to do. I want to ask if you would, don't wait six months, don't wait another year. Might I yet say, don't wait another day before you get saved. Don't wait another moment before you give your life over to God. Don't hesitate, don't deliberate before it is that you profess and confess, Lord, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Would you consider becoming a part of our family, becoming connected to our community. You have no idea how much I would relish in the idea of being your pastor. You have no idea how to give me goosebumps just to know that you have enlisted in the army known as New Birth. You have no idea of what it is that you offer unto God, which is yourself. You're going to find out, and it's not going to be too many days hence, that you're going to discover you can't beat God's giving no matter how hard you try. I want to challenge all of you to do it. I want you to meet us in doing it. I am excited about what our eyes are getting ready to see and what our ears are getting ready to hear. On Sunday is going to be a supernatural outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Next Tuesday, whatever you got to do, clear your calendar because I'm going into part two of this message. I just want to be saved. I want you to have it and I want you to be a part of it. God's got some great things in store for you. I've been praying for you and I want you to know I do it every day. But what I've been praying this day is that God will replenish, restore, and revitalize your savings. He's getting ready to do it. God bless you. Thank you for hanging out with us on tonight. And I can't wait to see you. I got good news for you. If you're dealing with any food insecurity, we still got food because we still got Jehovah Jireh who makes a way. This coming Saturday from 10 to 12 is our king's table. I want you to be a part of it. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere that the table is open and nobody will be denied. Just one day God can do it Just one day I believe it Just one day God can do it Just one day I believe it in Just one day God can do it Just one day
over this city. That's right, free groceries for anyone from 10 until 12 noon. Each and every Saturday at the Bell Family Life Center. Just pull up and be blessed. Everyone is welcome at the King's Table. And we want you to log on to newbirth.org and visit our online store. There you can get the book of the month, the new birth mask, and all your ministry needs. And while you're at newbirth.org, check out our newsletter. It's lots of helpful information. Log on today. Newbirth.org. Coronavirus disease 2019, referred to as COVID-19, has evolved from an isolated disease in a region in China to a global pandemic that has brought countries to a standstill, pushed hospital systems to the brink, and dragged the global economy into a recession like we've never seen before. These are trying times. With the U.S. death toll over 200,000, poor national leadership, and marching in the streets, protesting injustices against people of color, it looks as if there is no hope in sight. Oh, but there is hope in sight, and God has sent his mighty word through the mouth of Dr. Jamal Harrison Bryant. From midwife crisis to adjust to prospering in a pandemic, to making the top 10. These are all sermon series that you need to add to your personal library. You will be encouraged, empowered, and strengthened in this pandemic time in history. Visit calltoconquer.com to get your copies today. And we want you to mark your calendars for Tuesday, October 20th through Thursday, October 22nd. That's right. It's our vaccination revival, curing stagnation nightly at 7.30 p.m. Don't miss Dr. Jerome Glenn. But you represent the church wherever you go. Pastor Darius Nixon. Although I was in his mouth, you did not give me as prey to his teeth. And Pastor Tolan Morgan. God often calls you at a time when your life is a complete contradiction to your revelation. Also, special musical guests is Ja'Kalen Carr, Stout, and Miranda Curtis. October 20th through the 22nd, nightly online. Don't miss it. And that's gonna do it for today's video announcements.